Oh wow, you're looking beautiful today, my little beans. Welcome <laughs> to Travel Beans. I am Alex and behind the camera is Ooh. Emma. We are full-time travellers and we are currently in the Wye Valley in England. Behind me is the beautiful Wye Valley, but that is not why we're here, or at least not why I'm excited. Why I'm excited is right behind you. We're staying in a bloody castle! <laughs> This is St. Breville's Castle, and yes, this is another YHA hostel. That's right, it's a hostel and it's a castle, which makes this probably the most reasonably priced castle you could ever stay in. This area that I'm stood on now was the main keep of the castle, which was built by William the Conqueror in 1067 to keep out those pesky Welsh. However, once it collapsed, the stones were then used by the locals to build their own houses. And the building that you can see behind me now is the part of the castle that you can currently stay in. The YHA put on a variety of activities to get you in the medieval mood when you come to visit St. Breville's. <laughs> <laughs> One of those activities was archery, which Alex and I took part in this morning. We failed at this morning. We failed miserably at this morning, but we tried. <laughs> and following the archery, we actually had a castle tour to learn about the history of the place. This is the entrance to the castle, which was mostly used as a fortress to defend against the Welsh. Now what would happen is that they would come in here, and when they would, they would lock the front door, and also this door behind me, trapping them in this small section, and then they would get boiling sand, that's right, boiling sand, from the nearby beaches. They would pour the boiling sand onto the poor, little helpless, attacking Welshmen, which would then fuse the metal on their armour into their skin, effectively cooking them alive. And if they were lucky, enough to survive that, they would just come in and stab them all to make sure they were dead. That wasn't the only horrific practice that was going on here. Just through here, they had their own oubliette. What is an oubliette specifically? Because that's what kind of dungeon we're in. We are in the oubliette. Oubliettes are a French invention, like a lot of things in medieval England. It's basically a type of dungeon. The name is derived from the verb oublier, which means to forget. And the closest translation we can get into English for oubliette is the place of the forgotten. For that purpose, what better thing do you need than a trapdoor to the dungeons oubliette of St. Rebel's Castle. <gasps> you open the trapdoor, you drop your victim in feet first, close the trapdoor behind him, and that's it. It's a 10 metre drop down to that one. But you hit the bottom, you break your lower leg, some part of your lower leg on impact, you're then plunged into darkness, you're given no food, no water, nothing. That's it. And it is meant to be the most horrible possible way that you could die. It's an agonising, painful, slow process that's drawn out over three to four days. Robin Hood, if he ever was a real person, would have been ended up in a place like this. Hence why he's a legend, because the point of these is you don't keep records. With an oubliette, once you go in, you don't ever come out again. The point of it is to forget about you, make the world forget about you. So once you get put in that pit, all surface trace of your existence is then obliterated. This was a moated castle, and I'm actually stood in the moat right now. Now, it's been converted into gardens. What a lovely place to have a picnic. However, back in the day, this would have not been such an idyllic place, and the smell would have been horrific. It would have been worse than going in the bathroom after Emma. <laughs> <laughs> <Mate>. <laughs> <laughs> The reason it would have smelt so bad is they would have thrown everything into here. Most notably would be the dead bodies of prisoners or other people that were seen to be a threat, so it would have been used as a warning sign to other invaders. So you have been lucky enough to avoid being burnt alive by sand, and you have been also lucky enough to not be thrown in the oubliette. Now, there's one more place to put you, and that is up there in the prison. However, this is also not a walk in the park. Um, it was officially branded the worst prison in the country for the horrible and squalid conditions the prisoners were being kept in. There was nothing in here. No beds, no blankets, no duvets, no cushions, pillows. Literally not a thing. Just the prisoners, the clothes they were wearing, 
and the stone walls. Most of the prisoners in this prison would have been debtors, people that owe money for something, whether it's unpaid taxes or fines or something like that. But really, it's a prison. You just use it for anyone that you need to. Uh, if you look over on that wall, over there, there's a couple of windmills that have been etched into the wall. And this is one of the things that makes our prison particularly special, is that the whole thing has got graffiti all over it that gives us an insight into the kind of things that are going on in here. The really interesting one, though, is in this window here. Because this has writing we can actually read and understand. Robin Belcher, the day will come that thou shalt answer for it, for thou hast sworn against me. 1674. This is a death threat made against Robin Belcher. When you were put into prison, for the most part, you weren't given a jail sentence. It's not like today, where you get three weeks in prison, four months in prison, five years in prison. Back then, it was just they'll chuck you into prison, and they'll leave you there till they get bored of you or think that you've learned your lesson. So this person, William Baum, has been in this prison for three years or thereabouts. He's come in here because he's got some grudge against Robin Belcher, but after three years of being in this prison, he does eventually pass on. More than likely, he'd been taken upstairs to the guard room on a Sunday morning, and in front of the cheering and braying crowds at the front that have just come out of Sunday service, he will be hung. He gets pushed out of the window that's above this one, with the noose around his neck, hung until he is dead, the rope is cut, and his dead body will fall past this window into the moat, and just like the attacking forces, it'll be left there as an example to all those who dare to defy the law in St. Breville's. Don't, or this will happen to you next. Those were not the only unethical practices going on in this castle. Back in the medieval times, you weren't even safe if you were a child. Even six, seven, eight-year-old kids were forced to work without pay in the kitchens, turning the spit constantly without a break for about eight hours. To make things a little bit easier for the kids, they were given something called small beer, which was a pint glass with a bit of beer in the bottom and the rest filled up with water, thinking that the beer would kill off any bacteria in the water, which would hydrate them, and also the beer would make them a little bit drunk, which would make the work much easier, and they would also feel a lot less pain from the fire. But one of the main reasons that this room is so fascinating is because it's one of the only places in the world with a spit dog wheel that still works. When they decided to stop working children in the kitchen, they decided to move it from kids to animals. What they would do is they would breed a specific type of dog which would fit inside this wheel and it would be very much like a hamster wheel. So the dog would be put inside, they would run, which would turn the spit of the meat. To keep the dog running, they would actually put hot coals inside the wheel so the dog would have to run in order to not get burnt by the hot coals. And if it ran too fast, the coals would spin around and hit the dog in the front. And so this is how they made the wheel turn out at an appropriate speed so as not to burn the meat. No trip to a castle would be fully complete without having a medieval feast. <laughs> However, in England, that is pretty much impossible. Unless you stay with the YHA. That's right, they have got you covered <laughs> for a medieval feast. Not only that, you get to dress up in medieval clothes before having the feast. So the characters we have chosen for tonight's banquet are Emma, the knight in shining armour. And Alex, the hilarious jester. <laughs> We are the head of the banquet. I am black, and I am white, and I am red. All over. Ooh, ooh, come back. All are very creative answers, but I think the young lady at the front was correct. <laughs> that feast was epic. <laughs> We got to be the head of the feast. It was amazing. We had people sort of performing for us and cheering banging for the us, table. banging Hurrah! the tables. Hurrah! <laughs> this experience was amazing and it actually was such the perfect cherry on the top of our medieval cake. So if you're not from the UK, and actually if you're from the UK, this is definitely a very unique experience you have to try. If you have kids, this is a great thing to do with families, but also if your kid's at heart, like us, it's also fun. 
So if you like the video, give it a big medieval thumbs up. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell for future videos. Let us know in the comments what is the most unique place you've ever stayed. And for the first and only time in a castle, most likely, I will have to say, off with the head and beans out!